Good afternoon. Glad to be here. I am Alejandro Gares Molero, a postgraduate student in archaeology at the University of Valencia. First of all, I wanted to thank the CASA organizing committee for all the hard work and for trusting me to take part in this year's conference. I'm here to present a paper titled Embodying the Orimidon Base, Modern Theories of Sex and Ethnicity and their application to the study of archaeological materials. Hope you find it interesting. Well, for this paper, I plan to bring forward a modern discussion about how applying the principles of identity studies may help us, archaeologists, to interpret certain aspects of the materiality from the past. To do so, I am going to apply these ideas to the construction of sexual and ethnic identity in and around the so-called Eurymedon vase, along with other related artifacts and contexts. Let's go! The Urimidon base is an Attic red figured Oinoki, attributed either to the Triptolemos painter or to the painter of Louvre CX 1694, and it dates back probably around the mid 1460s BC. From this base, it outstands its own iconographic program, as it seems to embody a unique but exemplary representation of ancient Greek politics on ethnic dominancy. Let us have a look at it. On site A, we find a red leg man with a short bird almost naked, but for an animal skin mantle. He's running towards the right while stretching out his left arm in that direction and using his right hand to grasp his erect penis. On side B, there's another isolated character, an Eastern man, possibly of Persian origin, most probably an archer, as he carried with him an empty bow quiver. Contrary to the other figure, the Eastern man appears completely dressed and has the known as Phrygian cap. Besides his clothing, this figure stands for his pose. He stands with his upper body bent over, with his bad looks turned towards the green leg man, and his face, in terror, is depicted frontally. Moreover, both sides appear connected by this painted inscription. Two restitutions have been proposed for it. But essentially, both could be translated as I am a Remedon, but you, the Persian man, stand bent over. And as you can see, this is basically a message of sexual submission. Extensive literature has been produced on this base, generating different but overlapping interpretations. Most academicians have proposed this Oinoki to be directly related to the naval battle of the river Eurymedon. In the context of the Greco Persian Wars, this battle ended with a Greek victory. The fall, the Urimidon vase, could be interpreted as a sort of celebration of this triumph, in which the military victory would turn into a personal and a sexual one, claiming in Professor Dover, the creator of Greek homosexuality, owns what we Athenians have buggered the Persians. Alternative interpretations suggest this scene would also refer to a passage of a theatrical force, like this one, or it could directly be making fun of the Scythian archers' police of 5th century Athens. But, though the historical and literary interpretations are interesting, I want to invite you to go beyond that, to explore what is there on the object that is very often not taken into account. I am referring to its biopolitical implications about the politics of the bodies. David Halperin stresses a departing point for queer studies focused on the ancient Mediterranean. He says the sexual act in ancient Greece is a deeply polarizing experience. It serves to divide, to classify, and to distribute its participants into distinct and radically dissimilar categories. He also points out that in classical Athens, sexual objects came into two different kinds not male and female, but active and passive, aggressive and submissive. In fact, in these two chondos over here, we see two court scenes. The first one is a homoerotic and pedrastic scene, and the second one is a heteronormative one. But, as you can observe, the representational dynamics are similar as the woman and the young man occupy the same subordinated role. In other words, sexual intercourse in Western antiquity was a biopoliticizing enterprise used to mark power relationships, it was used to other the submitted. Let us see how this idea would work applied to the Limited Base. 
On the one hand, we had on the side A of the base a representation of the Greek leg man Eurymedon. He is naked and really is a convention for manliness in attic base painting. He is attacking, grasping his weapon, which is not a spur, but his own phallus. He is in movement, leading the action. On the other, we have on the side B the figure of the submissive Persian. He is completely dressed, contrasting with Eurymedon's nakedness. He is an archer who fights from afar, fact that was disapproved by the Greeks. Moreover, this character does not even have his bow. He's standing, bending over, waiting to be subdued, while looking front, when frontality is only given in Greek basis when the represented character is either slept, drunk, horrified, or dead, that is to say, when the character is deprived of any agency. Therefore, we are not in front of a realistic representation, but in front of a biopolitical one, in which the Persian has been submitted in all aspects. He is degraded to an inferior role. As a consequence, we consider him the other, instead of the other. Jasbir K. Poir dedicates her chapter Queer Times Queer Assemblages to explore the dynamics behind the systematic queerization that Eastern individuals have gone through throughout Western history, and, according to her, the Greek sodomizing Persian, or Western sodomizing Eastern scheme, is a continuum in space and time, and it is present even in nowadays belligerent interactions. She coins this phenomenon as queer assemblages, as, according to her, individuals are not queer, but assembled in a queerly way by a dominant power. So, applied to our base, it is through the sexual domination and the representational dynamics the artist chose when depicting the Persian that this individual became queer. And what is more, we could conclude by saying that this domination scheme enhances the political to become personal, to turn, sorry, to turn a defeat of war into a physical one achieving a new whole level of degradation of the enemy. Now, we are in the second part of the presentation. Having already explored the biopolitics involved in the Oinokis, the creative program, let us reflect on what could have been the immediate context of usability of the Eurymedon's base. The provenance of this base remains unknown. Despite this fact, we know this vessel's main use was to serve as a wine jug in Athenian Symposia. The Inoki is a wine jug, and as such, it was used to serve wine. Therefore, this Inoki would have moved in the symposium's context from one hand to another, and its iconographic program with it. Moreover, the shape of this base, with the handle on the back, would have made the men pouring the wine only be able to see one of the two sides of the Oinoki at the same time, while his nearest colleague would have come upon the white figure of the other side. Only when examining the whole base, the iconographic program would have made sense for them both, maybe bursting out, laughing while the other people at the banquet would surely be puzzled about the situation, wanting to know what the reason for such laughs was. So, that's how the biopolitics of this base would have come into play in its original context of usability. The degradation of the image of the Persian would have served as a source of humor and bonding. Moreover, we must not forget that homoerotic relationships were involved in this kind of parties, so the homoerotic program of this Oinoki could also be intended to help create the homoerotic atmosphere typical of symposia. But now, what we should ask ourselves is whether the Rimenon base was really used in an Athenian context or not. The truth is that we do not really know, as its finest spot is unknown. But taking into account the way by which Attic bases have arrived to private collection during the last two centuries, it's likely that this base was found somewhere in South Italy, possibly in an Etruscan or Magna Graecia's necropolis. In the first place, 
we find appealing archaeological evidence for the good reception of symposiac and homoerotic issues in the Magna Graecia polis. Take for example the famous tomb of the diver at Pestum, Campania, in which, by the way, attic figured bases were found. Throughout its four walls and ceiling, it develops a fresco in which 12 aristocratic Greek men are taking part in what seems to be a symposium in the afterlife. Eight of the symposiasts are represented laying together in homoerotic couples. And in each couple, one man is birded and the other is birdless. And this convention was used in attic based base painting and wall painting to represent differences in age between male characters. So we could be in front of a set of homoerotic erastai or their inactive counterparts of the relationship and their eromenoid, the submissive and younger partner. This gesture, for example, is used in attic based painting to represent this kind of pursue homoerotic scene. Hence, we see that in Magna Graecia there's evidence of the acceptance of both Attic bases and Athenian biopolitical dynamics regarding homoerotic representations. We have the other plausible hypothesis that the Riminon base may come from an Etruscan tomb. A special is the case of the tombs of the bulls at Tarquinia. The tombs of the bull, dating towards the end of the 6th century outstands for its walls paintings, is part in the Greek myth. The main section of these tombs comes with a representation of the ambush of Troilus narrated in the Trojan epics. Achilles, wearing armor and helmet, and armed with a sword, is represented at the left part of the panel hidden in the thickets, behind a fountain structure waiting for the Trojan prince Troilos, who is coming from the right. The Trojan prince, darker skin, unaware of Achilles' presence, is calmly riding his horse completely naked but for a sword hat or hat, and with the only protection of a spear. According to the main version of the myth, Troilus will be chased and then killed by Achilles in front of the temple of the sun god Apollo Helios, whose breath in consequence, wood ladder fell upon Achilles. However, there's another version of the myth in which there's no such a prophecy nor death, but Achilles perpetrates his ambush out of sexual desire for Troilus, ending with the young priest being raped. This version is the one represented here. Let us take a look at the other section of this program, the one taking place on the right side of the upper frieze of the wall. This depicts homoerotic sex between two characters, which are being observed by a charging bull. One may observe that this scene presents deep connections with the Troilus scene at different levels. Representationally, the two human characters of both panels represent the same physical features, and in the central panel, the sun god is symbolized by a setting sun just as the bull, sacred animal of the sun god Apollo Helios, is about to do in the homoerotic scene. The underlying power dynamics of both scenes are also parallel and a continuation. Troilos Fresco depicts Achilles about to subdue the, the Trojan prince with his force, and moreover, it is expressed in hunter and prey dynamics. Achilles is hiding, no? That is to say, the political submission of the enemy is represented through primitive dynamics just as the freeze of the, sodomis of the sodomization is seen is doing. We should remember that Achilles, for the Greeks, represented what to be a real Greek macho man meant, and Troilus was nothing but an eastern, young, effeminate prince, as Troy, for the Greeks, was perceived as the East not Greece. Therefore, we could convincingly say that queer and polarizing iconographies, as the one present in the Remedium vase, would have been greatly received by the Etruscans, who seem to serve similar biopolitics to the Athenians regarding the physical submission of the authors.
In fact, it seems that the submission of the Eastern was considered a symbol of prestige, not as we see in this tomb. Lastly, to conclude, I'd like to say that with this paper I wanted to present another way of interpreting archaeological artifacts and contexts, based on the human bodies, either real or represented, and the biopolitical dimension that is hidden behind them. Using the Remedium base as a conductor, we have been able to see some of the views ancient Greeks and Italics had on ethnic dominancy and same-gender relations, allowing us to break all topics such as the, fam the famous ideal of Greek homosexuality, while emphasizing less explored ideas like the similar biopolitical views on ethnicity and sex served by Greeks and Etruscans. All things said, thank you for your time and patience.